Hey, hey, what's up, guys? It's Jordan with the Laundromat Resource Podcast. It is show 139, and I'm pumped you're here today because today we are back on the show, Steve Andrews. It's been almost three years to the day since he's been on. I think he was uh, episode 35, incredible episode way back in the archives. And uh, today, even better, uh, super good uh, episode today. And, uh, Steve, I almost said Andrews. Steve uh, shares a ton of great uh, information. He's got some amazing stories of uh, building new laundromats and some stuff that happens with those, which you're gonna love. But he also shares a whole lot of details about his business. He's killing it. You can check out uh, photos of his laundromat on the show notes page, which is at laundromatresource.com slash show 139. Beautiful, beautiful laundromat in Tennessee. Uh, and he just kills it. And uh, not only does he kill it, but he's killing it right in the middle of some very, very strong competition. So uh, he tells you exact. I asked him, I say, how are you competing and thriving so well in the midst of all this competition? Gives you the formula. So awesome episode today. Let's jump into it with Steve right away. Uh, also, happy holidays if you're listening to this when it's coming out. Uh, cause Christmas is about a week away, just a little less than a week away when this comes out. So happy holidays. And if you're listening some other time of the year, happy, whatever time of year it is. How about that? All right, let's jump into it with Steve. Oh man, we are here back again with Steve Andrews. Steve, how you doing, man? Good, good. How are you, Jordan? I am doing awesome. Thank you for coming on again. Uh, this is your second time on the podcast, which by the way, is a huge accomplishment. I just want to point that out. It's a big deal. Yeah, for thanks. Do I get do I get like an IMDb listing now or something? You know what? We should we should have our <laughs> own sort of IMDb for just the podcast because uh, that would be there. You go. There you go. Be pretty cool. <laughs> I like that idea. Already, we're starting off on a good foot. Uh, but man, it has been over a hundred episodes uh, since you've been on. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, I think it's been actually almost exactly three years. So. I've gained a couple pounds and lost a couple of brain cells, but you know, we're still intact. <laughs> yeah. I see you have not lost any hair though. You've got more hair. Uh, yeah, I added a little bit more, but this is a, honestly, man, this is a last ditch effort. <laughs> I just turned 48 last week. So, you know, I'm trying to uh, take advantage of it while it's still there. <laughs> yeah, in anticipation of it going, yeah. Awesome. It's, it's inevitable. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just, I feel like, you know, hair, you know. Give it, take it, whatever. It's all good. Care today, gone tomorrow, right? That's right. <laughs> well, hey, man, just in case anybody doesn't know who you are, uh, first of all, shame on you for not knowing the Steve, An uh, Steve Andrews. Uh, but why don't you catch us all up with uh, a little bit about who you are, what you do? Yeah, sure. So um, Steve Andrews, I'm based out of uh, Nashville, Tennessee, actually live in a, well, I was going to say small town, but it's not anymore. It's just south of Nashville uh, called Franklin. I mean, it's like in all the magazines That's where been people are up. saying, oh, yeah, like move here, move here. And we're like, no, please, please don't. But anyway, it's a great, great place to live. Um, I really, really enjoy it. I've got a wonderful family. been married to my wife for 16 years. She is my absolute partner in crime, and I could do none of, of what I do with, without her. Uh, two kids, Sophie and Max, uh, 12 and 10 years old. So right in the thick of that part of it, got a future teenager coming up on us and um, not looking forward to that, but you know, we'll, uh, we'll deal with it as it comes. Um, but uh, I've been in the laundry industry now for a little over five years. Um, matter of fact, we're, we'll be coming up on our the five-year anniversary of opening our first store uh, back in 2018 uh, next week. So uh, looking forward to that. Um, we've got uh, two stores. Both are kind of in the broader Metro Nashville area, um, actually in the process of, uh, of, of beginning store number three. A uh, little, we can talk about that a little more later, but that's a little different venture, uh, both in where we're doing it, how we're doing it, all that kind of stuff. Um, but really excited about that. Um, prior to the laundry industry, I spent about 17 years in the corporate world, 
Um, we talked about this in the in the last podcast we did, but you know, it really was a a struggle for me in that in that world. And I was really looking for an opportunity, and lo and behold, here comes dirty laundry to save my day. Right. <laughs> Um, so, um, learned a lot from that, especially when it comes to, um, you know, customer, uh, experience, client management, uh, managing teams and, and marketing. So really applied all that logic that I gained there into what we do today. And, um, honestly have never looked back. Um, I used to, used to sit at my desk in my corporate job and stare out the window and just dream of the world outside. And now I'm actually out there every single day uh, in the world with my own business, doing my own thing. And it's just, it's the greatest thing ever. It's the biggest blessing that's ever happened in my life, other than my family, of course. Right. All right. They're probably not going to listen to it. So you can be truthful here. It's fine. Hey, I might make them. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. (laughs) They should be listening to this. Yeah, we just get in the car and I turn it on, you know. What, what are they going to do then? Tell me to turn it off? Right. Put their earbuds in is what they're going to do and ignore you. Yeah, That's what right. mine do. <laughs> 10 and 12, man. Same same with mine. I'm, I'm right in the thick of it with you. But yeah, awesome. yeah. Um, and, you know, last time we talked, I think we were just getting started with store number two. So, um, obviously, we've completed that and, and it's been a kind of a little bit of a up and down ride from there, but, uh, some good, some bad, but all, all positive, uh, when you look at the total, total value. So awesome. Well, let's get into it a little bit. And just in case, uh, anybody hasn't listened to your first episode yet, uh, I believe it was episode 35 that you were on, uh, the last time that you were on. So make yeah, sure you go so. back and listen to episode 35. Seriously, super duper good episode. And one of the more popular episodes, uh, too. So, uh, do not miss that one. And I, I think uh, if memory serves well, again, I'm also, you know, getting up there. So memory is a little. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but I think we did talk a little bit about how you pulled the trigger on uh, escaping your corporate gig, because I know there's a lot of people out there who that is the goal. That is the dream to get out of that nine to five and uh, do your own thing, have your own, you know, build your own life the way that you want to. So, uh, yeah, that's a good one go back and listen to. Yeah, it's, um, it, it was, it was something I dreamed about a lot. And you know, what's funny is, uh, even to this day, I'll, I still have, I'll call them nightmares, kind of a recurring nightmare that I have. And, and I don't know subconsciously what this means. So if there's any dream experts out there, maybe you can give me some feedback, but subconsciously, uh, I have this recurring nightmare that I am back in the corporate world, in the office, sitting at a desk, doing kind of the nine to five thing. So, yeah, I kind of wake up in, with night sweats on that one, but wake up and everything's all good again. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're if you're out there listening to this and you're having similar nightmares uh, <laughs> that you're going to be stuck in there, uh, listen, this is the episode for you and uh, episode 35, the episode for you. So go check that out. Uh, for sure. There you go. Uh, all right. So you have a couple of laundromats now getting ready to venture on number three, which I feel like you did mostly to secure a third podcast episode. Is this correct? Yeah, man. Okay. That's, that's my goal for everything. I'm trying to create my own, <laughs> you know, reality TV show here. <laughs> you know, I can admire the strategic thinking that you've got going on here and I will honor it. So we'll definitely yeah. be back on third <laughs> when you get that third one open. Um, all right. Well, no. I mean, listen, you've, you sort of teased us a little bit with some ups and downs and stuff, but let's talk about, uh, you know, how's, how's store number one doing? And then let's roll into, uh, how you found store number two and sort of the, the narrative, if you will, of store number two. Sure. Yeah. Um, so store one's doing fantastic. Um, talked about this before, but as far as location, it is in the perfect location. Um, We, um, uh, if if there's anything that I would change about what we did at store number one is I would make it larger. Um, We, we do um, an ungodly number of turns there on average per day. Um, I have an unbelievable staff there, which is a lot of, of, of what makes us successful. 
Um, but yeah, store number one's doing well. Um, at that store, we do strictly uh, self serve and drop off laundry. Um, we have some commercial customers, but they're they're drop off uh, drop off specific. Um, and and we've grown there uh, quite a bit. Um, one of the things that we did, at, you know, I, I like to reinvest in the stores on a regular basis. Um, not only just for the benefit of the store, but I like for the customers to see that we're doing that. Um, so we've done some re- remodeling there, uh, and I actually expanded our parking lot. Uh, it's been about, uh, I'd say about 18 months ago now. Uh, originally, we had 17 parking spots at that store, which, you know, when we built it, I was like, oh, this is this is perfect. You know, I, I don't see a need for more. Unfortunately, we we had a need for more. So um, we had some space in the back of the property. Uh, I got approval from the landlord to uh, to add on to the parking lot. And so we added 11 additional parking spots. So we're up to 28 now. Um, And on Sundays, uh, when I'm there, sometimes I still count 30 cars or so. So we still don't have enough. But unfortunately, we're out of space, so we can't add any more. Uh, but, uh, that was a, a pretty big investment, but I think it paid off quite a bit. Uh, we were, were, felt like we were losing a lot of business with people pulling up and seeing how busy it was and moving on to another laundry. <clears throat> we're right smack dab in the middle of about seven or eight laundries within our one mile radius. So, um, by expanding the parking lot, it made it look a little less sparse and maybe enticed a few more customers come in because we did see an improvement in our turns per day. Um, we definitely saw an improvement in our revenue. Um, also, this are kind of part of the ups and the downs uh, since last time we talked. I think since last time we talked, which was three years ago, we were we were we've been robbed like three times, um, which you know is worst case scenario. Unfortunately, they didn't didn't take a lot of of money. It was more the damage that was done to the equipment and whatnot. So as part of some of the renovations that we did, we kind of took security in mind and actually created a safe room for all of our change machines, uh, created extra barriers to kind of keep anybody who might get into our back room, make it a little tougher for them to get to it, um, upgraded our alarm systems, camera systems, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, if I'm suggesting anything to a, a new owner, I would say think of the worst case scenario when you are building and uh, take security uh, very, very carefully because it's something that unfortunately happens. Um, And especially as times get tougher, you know, the economy gets tougher, people are going to be more and more desperate. And so, um, you know, it kind of leads to bad situations. So anyway, um, since we've done that, we haven't had any incidents. So, you know, we're going on. I would say about seven or eight months now without any any real issues. Um, I also hired, we're open 24 hours at that first store. Uh, so I hired a nighttime attendant. Um, unfortunately, he can only work five days a week, uh, but we kind of jumble up his schedule so it's not real predictable. And uh, he's there at nighttime, which kind of helps um, avoid problems with people uh, coming in and doing things they're not supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also helps with uh, customer security as well. So they like to see someone working at night when they come in. And, and honestly, we've seen an increase in our overnight uh, overnight uh, self-service. So that's a, that's a good positive as well. Um, I think when we talked last time, we were about ready to, to, to start demo on location two. Uh, Wait, hold we on. Talked pause, pretty in- pause, pause, pause. Okay. Yeah. Cause you brought up a lot of stuff I want to ask you about, about store number one before we get into store number two. Uh, yeah, go ahead. A lot of good stuff. Oh, well, first of all, thank you for sharing about the, uh, you know, the being robbed stuff. I mean, that does happen uh, just for the, for the robbery stuff. Was that yeah. people trying to break into change machines or washers or was that like, yeah, specifically the, the change machine. So I, um, sometimes this is a good trait. Sometimes this is a bad trait, but when we first built that store, Yes, I put locks on things, but I tend to trust people. I I tend to want to trust people. Mm -hmm. And um, you you just, you can't do that in this, in this situation. So we just didn't have good enough locks on the doors to our back room. So we're open 24 hours. 
And we kind of have our front desk set up as an open front desk, kind of like a, a hotel front desk, if you will. I just kind of like that open feel when we have people there working. Uh, but we take everything down and put it in a back room behind a locked door. Um, and behind that locked door is, of course, all of our supplies. It's where we store all of our, our drop off. It's also access to the back of the change machines. At least that's the way it was before. And so people were breaking through the door. Um, we did have an alarm on the, on the, on the door, but unfortunately the response time just wasn't fast enough to catch anyone. And, um, uh, unfortunately I'm not familiar with what the, the types of locks on the change machines are, but we had two different change machines. One was just a straight coin changer and another was a bill recycler so that it would give change for large bills. The, uh, the coin only changer has like a, a flush lock. So you literally, when you unlock it, it pops out and then you spin it to, to open it. Mm -hmm. The uh, bill changer has kind of a, a protruding lock on it. Um, and when you open it, it pulls out a little farther. Um, another suggestion, make sure on your, your rear load coin machines, you get the ones that are flush uh, with the machines. American Changer makes those the newer ones that we have. Uh, the original machine we had was a row, which I think is now uh, a part of American Changer. But uh, the flush locks uh, are a lot harder to get into than the ones that are protruding. Um, so <laughs> I, I counted the, the time, and once the guy got back there, he was able to get into that the one with the protruding lock in less than 30 seconds. And, okay, the first time this guy came... <laughs> Remember I said that the first time this guy came, he broke into it, did not know that there is a, uh, a cash uh, box at the top and didn't touch it. So his goal was to steal the coin hopper, which as you know, is quite heavy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it was rather comical as comical as it can be when someone's robbing you to watch him try and handle that coin hopper and get it out the door uh, he spilt coins all over the floor. He spilt coins out in the parking lot. Uh, he was able to take some of the coins with him. Um, he also took our, our petty cash drawer, which we had right there beside it, which again, I know that's dumb. Now I know, but it is what it is. Um, he came back again after we repaired that machine and, um, broke in the second time and uh, this time he knew about the coin on the, the coin box or the uh, the cash uh, box so he took the cash and the coins again uh, the good news was our cameras were pretty good so we had him and the guy had been on a spree for months in the area he had been robbing other laundry mats uh, car washes uh, convenience stores. And so, uh, based upon some of our video, because he had a pretty identifying tattoo on his arm, uh, they were able to catch him. So, um, he, uh, he's, he's actually in jail right now. So yay. Um, but, you, but you anyway, didn't money back though, did you? <laughs> no, no, we did not. Um, and unfortunately insurance, insurance did cover the, the machine cause he destroyed it the second time. Um, and, what we did as part of the renovations is we moved our coin coin machines to a different location, put them in a separate safe room with two by sixes and double bolted metal doors <laughs> and got the flush locks on everything that we do. So at the very least, once he breaks in one, well, he won't, but once someone breaks in, the alarms will go off. They'll have to break into another door and then they'll have to break into the cash machines. So we keep all of our cash in the safe room now. Um, and, uh, have, you know, really good 4k cameras with night vision on there. Um, good, pretty good relationship with the, uh, local Metro police. And so hopefully we won't see this issue again as best that we can. So, yeah, well, sorry to hear that you, uh, went through that fun I, times. Yeah. I've been through some similar stuff and I know a lot of us have, so, uh, it's, you know, I don't know kind of dumb to rob a laundromat in my opinion but you know right i know it is what it is i you know i had more people trying to break into individual machine koi boxes than the 
change oh, machine, wow. which I think trying to pry them out or drill out the lock or prying them, drilling them, cutting them, all kinds of different things I've seen in my, on my laundromat, which, and the, the reward there, you know, you got to time it real well, like right before I'm coming to collect them to make right. it kind of sort of worth your while. But even then, I don't know. I, I, I used to have one of those, um, white vend right, uh, soap. Oh yeah. Vendors that hang on the wall. And um, that got broken into twice. And then the third time they just ripped it off the wall and put it in their car and took it home. <laughs> Good <riddance. laughs> yeah. So I don't have those anymore. We use a, vend- a separate vending machine that's uh, uh, on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> There's no way they're getting away with this one. So There's, I mean, man, people do the craziest things. I've had people come in through the roof behind the dryers, like through the, <laughs> the ventilation. I had, I had people literally rip down an entire wall one time. It was oh my gosh, wild, uh, wild stuff. So, anyways, it's not boring. Not boring. No, uh, it's not. Right. It's okay. not. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for sharing that stuff. I mean, I think that's helpful. You know, again, like when we're sharing, like here's the experience. Here's what I did to yeah. try to, you know, put the kibosh on that. You know, yeah, I think that just helps all of us out. So, I appreciate you sharing that stuff. Um, it's you mentioned, yeah, you mentioned your first location. It's just like the perfect location. I'm yeah. just out of curiosity. Like, can you, can you tell us like a little bit about like what makes this location so great so that we know what to be looking for to? Sure. Um, so number one, the, the demographics were really, really good. Um, when I first started looking at laundromats with my distributor, uh, they, they would talk about, looking at the percent of households that are renters in the three mile radius, specifically one mile as well, but three miles really kind of where you'll pull from. Um, and you know, they would say, you know, if you can get 35, 36% renters, that's, that's a good number. Um, so this location we're North of 60%. Um, and that's out of a base population of about 102,000 people. So in the, in the three mile radius, there's over a hundred thousand people. So it's heavy, heavy residential. And we're kind of on the edge of a, of a small commercial area at a major four way intersection. And then, uh, just up from that intersection is the interstate exit. So what happens is a lot of my customers have to drive right past me to get to the commercial area to either go grocery shopping or get gas or go to the interstate to go to work, go wherever they're going to go about town. So um, we're, we're literally on the way to almost everything that people are, are going to do in their day-to-day lives. So that, uh, that really makes a nice, nice setup. And this location is close to the road. Uh, so we've got good signage. We have huge windows so you can see inside day and night, really well lit. Um, all of our, our large machines are right up front. So you can see what kind of capacity, if you're driving by the store from the road, you can see what kind of capacity we have just by looking through the window. Um, and you know, it just, it, it, it's really nice to be close to your customers and to have other things to do. Now, typically we don't like for our customers to put their clothes in the laundry and then go somewhere else. Uh, but there are things within walking distance that people can go do so that they're gone for 10, 15 minutes and then can come back. Um, since, since we opened that, that store back in 2018, there's been a, uh, uh, a grocery store open up right next door. Um, there's been some new restaurants open up across the street. Um, uh, a couple of, uh, a couple of the convenience stores have kind of remodeled and revamped their location. So uh, they've really improved the area. Um, and, and the kind of the general area that this is located used to be a really hopping area and back in the eighties, cause there was a huge mall that was there. And of course, you know, the story of malls, it kind of went downhill over the course of the nineties and into the early two thousands, but now they're kind of revamping it. There's a brand new outdoor uh, outlet mall that just opened. So it's drawing a lot of people. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's really helped as well, but location is super important. Think about where your customers are going to go on a day-to-day basis and how you can fit into that process. And then look at the numbers on paper 
with your distributor to see how many renters you have. You know, you could have 60% renters, which is great, but if there's 14 people that live in the one mile radius, then, you know, that's not going to be a good fit. But if there's, you know, 40,000, 60,000, 100,000, then you're going to have the chance to have a good business there. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, awesome uh, location tips uh, there for us because, you know, as we all know, like, you know, it's location, location, location in real estate, but Always. in laundromats, maybe even more so. Add another yep. location or two onto that. Because uh, <laughs> once you're there, you're there and your business, you know, you, you can't really move it most times. And so uh, that, you get a bad right. location, kill your business. I'll add one additional thing. So being near the, the interstate exit helps as well because, like I mentioned, there's seven well, actually, there's nine now laundromats within the three mile radius of us, and they they have a lot of choices, but they can get to us really easy. Um, I have a lot of customers that, you know, they just go and Google online and see that we've got a, a four point seven rating on Google and say, hey, these guys have a good rating. All these other guys aren't aren't rated as high, so I'll drive past them to get to them, and so it's just really easy to do that in this case. So, yeah, awesome. Another just another tick mark in the column of, Hey, get good customer ratings and reviews for your, yes, for your, absolutely. Store. It's a big, big deal. Big, big deal. Uh, okay. A couple other things, uh, that I wanted to ask. Well, you mentioned you're competing with, you know, seven to nine laundromats in a, in a three mile radius. Uh, I mean, can you tell me a little bit? I mean, that sounds like pretty intense. Can you tell me a little bit about how you're still doing well in that location while you're, such yeah. Heavy competition. So when we first built the store, there were six. So since we 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 since we built ours, there have been uh, three others that have been built in the area. So there's three newer than us. Um, I, I think for us, our biggest competing, uh, our biggest way to compete with all those others is just our 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 employee staff. Um, so. One other demographic uh, thing about the area is that there's a lot of Hispanic folks in the area. And so uh, obviously a lot of Spanish speakers. And so all of my employees at this location are all bilingual. So they can speak English and Spanish um, and we can we can help both customers regardless of, of, of whether they're speaking one or the other. Um, and, and that's a big that's a big uh, calling card, if you will. And all of them, um, number one, I pay them really well. I, I really try my best to take care of them, to, to make an environment that they enjoy coming to. And so I, we, we talked about this last time, but I rely on them to take care of my customers because I know if I take care of them, they'll do that. And so um, customer service is a big part of it. You can go and read our, um, our reviews and a lot of them will mention our, our employees by name. And so I love it when customers do that because number one, that means our employees are engaging with them. But number two, it tells me that they now have a personal connection with us. And so it also gives me a chance to pat that customer on the, or that employee on the back publicly. So, you know, if they say, oh, we were, we were in there the other day and Darling helped us with this or Francis helped us with that. And I'm like, Yes, we love Darling. We love Francis. They're awesome. And so um, and, and I've, I've had my employees tell me, hey, I was reading the, the ratings that we have and I saw that you mentioned us. So thank you. So um, don't be surprised if your employees are reading your own ratings. So they want to see that they're doing a good job, too, most times. So, okay. um, But, you know, I would say our calling card is definitely our employee staff. And then just I. I turn red when I see all of our out of out of order signs are red. So it turns me red. I hate seeing a machine down. So I work really, really hard to try and keep everything up and running. And as I mentioned, it's a pretty, pretty high turn store. So we get a lot of usage. And so I'm constantly having to uh, deal with machines that that go down one way or the other. Um, and so we're, we're trying to deal with that on a regular basis to ensure that our downtime is, is short, if at all. Um, and just cleanliness. That's, that's the number one thing for any laundromat. And I think that's been said on here a million times is as clean as we can keep it, the more people will come back. 
when I tell people that our store is five years old, they kind of look at me in surprise. And to me, that's the biggest compliment that we could get for our cleanliness. Yeah. And then you got that great location also. Uh, yeah. Can't change that. Don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I feel like you're, you're leading me uh, right down the question path that I was trying to get. So, I mean, you, oh, you talk, did we plan, we plan this? What? We, <laughs> we, you know, subconsciously, maybe, I don't that's know, right. maybe. Great minds uh, think alike. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. So do not so great minds though. So I'm not sure if the jury's <laughs> yeah. still out on uh, which, yeah, is, right. which category we fall into. Uh, well, maybe it's just me. I don't know. You seem, yeah. you seem like you know your no. stuff. Uh, I mean, you, you mentioned multiple times now you said, Hey, you have this great team. It's one of the you know biggest draws for your laundromat. I'm, I just yeah. literally just right before we jumped on this, got off a call, uh, with a couple who's doing awesome, got four laundromats here in California and mm-hmm. killing it. Uh, but one of their struggles is finding and keeping staff. Do you have any tips on how, like, how are you finding staff and how do you, how do you keep them around long-term? Well, um, I think in this day and age, that is the hardest thing for a laundromat owner to do, um, is to try and get a team that you can trust and and rely on. Um, you know, a lot of the, I have, I have two stores and I have a store manager at each store. Uh, both of those store managers started out at my first store. And when we first hired those girls and the teams that work for them, Um, I always try and myself as the owner sit down with the new employees and, and essentially kind of let them know, number one, that I'm not sitting up here on my, my throne and looking down on, on the world. I'm a part of the team as well. Uh, So I want them to get to know me. I want to know them. I want to know about their family, but more than anything else, I want them to see my vision for what we're doing. So I'll be honest with them right up front and I'll tell them, hey, look, um, I know this is just a laundromat and you might think that, hey, you know, I'm just going to go over here and clean and fold some clothes, you know, what have you. But I don't think of it like that. I think of this as being a place where our customers can come, feel proud that they come and have a clean environment so they can get their clothes clean. Wow. Imagine that. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? Uh, but also be respected, um, be treated well. And I want us to stand out among all the other laundromats because, hey, guess what, employee? They could go anywhere else. Look at all these other places around us that they could go. And guess what? If they go somewhere else, then what's going to happen to what you're doing here? It's going to go away. So we need to make sure that we we love on our employees, that we are our, our uh, customers, uh, I don't know, maybe that's a Freudian slip because I do love on my employees, but we love on our employees and our customers and we make sure that um, they're, they're going to want to come back and see you, you know, ask them questions about their day. Ask them, hey, it's it's Wednesday, Bob, you usually come on Tuesday. What's what's going on? You're a little late this week, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but you can you can learn pretty quickly with any employee uh, if, if they're going to be bought into your vision or not, um, you know, you can tell basically, uh, you know, we'll do usually a 90 day trial period and we'll tell them, hey, you're going to be in here for 90 days. Uh, we've got a training program that you're going to go through. Usually it's a couple of weeks long. We will teach you how to do everything in this store that needs to be done. Now, you might say, well, why do I need to be taught how to fold a T-shirt? Well, because we have a certain way that we want you to fold that T-shirt. It might match your way. Hey, that's great. You're going to learn really easy. Uh, It might be a little bit different. Uh, And if it is, you know, we want you to do it this way uh, because we want everything that we do to look the same, no matter which employee did it from which store, uh, to really kind of have that uh, McDonald's cheeseburger feel to it. You know, you you know, they know what they're going to get one way or the other. Um, But you know, we'll we'll try and sit down with them as after we go through the uh, the training process after the two weeks is up, and say, okay, where are we? How do you feel about it? Um, you know, a lot of our employees are running the store by themselves, so they are the lone employee there. You know, how are you feeling comfortable enough to uh, to you know pick up the pick up the ball and run on your own now? Um, and 
and usually they'll they'll kind of let us know if there's something they're not feeling quite comfortable with or something they need some some additional help on but i always ask my managers to stay very closely in tune with uh, with with what's going on, especially with new employees, and especially if they if they need help with something, um, so after they they're out and on their own, at that point they're eligible for performance bonuses, which is really the big enticement going forward. So um, uh, the you know I don't even know what minimum wage is here in Tennessee now. I think it's somewhere like seven to eight dollars somewhere in that neighborhood. But uh, we start our employees out at fifteen dollars an hour. And then uh, we also pay differentials on the weekends. So we pay a shift diff for, for Saturday, which is an extra dollar, and a shift diff for Sunday, which is an extra $2. So uh, that becomes available as well after they make it through their trial period, which is a, an additional bonus for them to kind of get in, get bought in, and kind of see you know, what our environment is like, what, uh, what the culture is like within our store. Um, we also pay out uh, bonuses uh, as well, monthly bonuses based off of our wash dry fold. So uh, that's an additional incentive that they become eligible for after the trial period as well. So it's really kind of one of those things where we kind of hold a carrot out in front of them. We say, hey, this is kind of how we want you to be as an employee here and what we expect. Uh, you know, it's, it's not really that hard. It's, it's work hard and be friendly. You know, that's that's not a thing that that's that's really, you know, revolutionary in any way. Um, problem is trying to find those folks that are willing to do that these days. Um, and I, I have to admit, we have we have gone through a lot of, of not of just not good fits for what we're trying to do. And uh, the sooner that you can identify those and and kind of ask them to, to go look for another opportunity, the better you're going to be. Um, but, um, we, we like to think that if we can explain our vision to them, give them the carrots out there waiting for them and the incentive to perform well, that they'll live up to those expectations. Not always the case, unfortunately. Uh, but I think the best that you can, uh, can lay out that, that vision for how you want them to be and lay out the opportunity there. And I think that's, that's where you'll find you, it might be one out of 10, but when you get that one, it is a precious, precious thing. And no matter what you do with that one, make sure you you take care of them going forward and do what do what they need to keep them happy to a certain extent, obviously. Uh, but I like to, um, you know, I just I just finished payroll earlier today, and I was able to pay out really nice Christmas bonuses this year. And I'm really excited about that because I know when they check out their paycheck on Thursday and Friday, there's going to be, because I haven't told them about it. So it'll be just a little extra. Uh, and I just, I just like for them to know that I appreciate them. And we, we know that together we're a great team, but, you know, separate, we're nothing. So, Yeah, I, I love that. And I love the sort of the, the push pull of selling the vision, which is where you started. Uh, and then training for the vision, uh, which is where you followed up yeah. and then incentivizing the vision. Uh, dude, like that's money right there. Well, and, and the problem is it's, it's finding, like I said, finding those folks that, that can, can hit all those steps and, and then be good with it. Because unfortunately there seems to be a little bit of an epidemic of, of hard workers and, and workers who, um, you know, I, I tell my managers, I was like, look, Yes, I own this business, but this this store is your store. It's it's you. Your name is on it. Um, so when things happen here, good. That's good for you. Um, and and you know the employees need to feel the same way. If, if if someone picks up a drop off and they are so excited about it and, and put a, a a post up on Google or, or shoot an email through Google to us and say, hey, Esmeralda was just awesome today. Her the, her folding, it was perfect. Everything was separated so that I could put a bag in my kid's room. I could put a bag in uh, my uh, you know, father's room, and then I could put a bag in my husband and I's room. So everything was separated perfectly. You know, you've made their life easier. And the, the employees can feel that. They want to know that when they wear that badge that it says their name, not the wash house. So. Awesome. I love it. Uh, all right. I, have, I think two more questions. 
based yeah. on your first one, then we can roll into your second one uh, and, and how that process went. Um, but uh, number one, I mean, you, you mentioned uh, that you try to reinvest into your business every year. Can you give some like examples of things you do to reinvest in your business? Cause I mean, I think this is great. We, maybe we talked about this, but I know this has been talked about yeah. on, uh, on the podcast a couple of times before, but I mean, I think doing something in your business to, uh, number one, keep it maintained, updated, not let it get stale, but number two, to, to right. demonstrate to your customers, uh, Hey, I, we care about this business and we're going to try to keep it, you know, nice and fresh and, and updated for you. Uh, but can you give some examples of what yeah. reinvesting in your business looks like maybe? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so first and foremost, I would say the, the parking lot expansion was the number one thing that we've done that really, I think added to our bottom line. Uh, but uh, we've done some other things at that store. Like I mentioned the security room, but uh, we totally revamped all of our signage at that store. Uh, I wanted to go to something that was a little more simple uh, that people could see. It was a lot more, uh, you know, visible for customers to see. So to show them what size machines and where they were. Uh, and we, we kind of made everything uh, a little more coherent from store to store so that the signage is the same in both stores. The color scheme is the same in both stores. So we repainted. Um, as an option to uh, kind of, again, go with that McDonald's type feel where you know what you're going to get from store to store. Um, we also upgraded our vending machines, um, which uh, when we first opened that first store, you know, when it come time to look at vending machines, the capital was getting pretty low at that point. <laughs> so uh, we bought some used vending machines and they worked well for the first four years that we had the store. Uh, but I wanted something that was a little more modern looking and something that would provide a little bit better service to our uh, for our customers. So uh, we went out and bought a couple of uh, Omni uh, vending machines through uh, discount vending. Um, so now we actually vend all of our soaps through one machine and all of our snacks and drinks through the other. So previously, you remember I mentioned we had the little wall soap machine. Well, then we were selling soap over the counter, which is additional work for the uh, for the attendants. But now we do it through the vending machine. So now it takes a little work off the attendants. They can focus on helping customers cleaning and doing drop off. And it also helps the customers that come uh, overnight when there's no attendant on site. They can they can access soap that way. Um, I also I've, I'm kind of a uh, aesthetic geek as far as that goes. So um, we, we did a huge vinyl mural on one of the large walls in our store. I put it out on one of the Facebook pages at one point, but it really allows us to really punch people in the face with our brand when they walk in the store. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm not a graphic artist by any means, but I'm fairly adept at, at Photoshop. So I created like this graphic of it's kind of the inside of a washing machine with the water splashing around and then our logo right on top of it, bright, uh, you know, so that it really stood out. And so it took up one whole wall uh, of our laundry. So that as soon as they walk in, they'll know they're at the wash house. Um, and, and it kind of, it gives it more of a commercial feel. Um, you know, I, I see a lot of places where there's just nothing on the walls or there's just way too much on the walls, you know, it gets too crowded. And so there, there's a happy medium there where you can have a nice aesthetic. And I mean, I've had a lot of people ask me, so is this a franchise store? And I'm always proud to say no, but, uh, you know, it, it has that feel of, of something like that. So, um, quick on that, on that mural, yeah. uh, do you, well, number one, can you send me a picture of it so we can put it on the show notes? Yeah. People love. To yeah. I've got some pictures of it. What that looks like, uh, and then number two, I mean, do you know, I know this is a little while ago, but do you know about ish, how much that costs to do that? Yeah. Um, so as far as the printing of it and the, uh, the actual installation, I mean, it was a couple thousand dollars to, uh, to do everything, which is not bad. I mean, it, it's a really large wall. So I, I would, I would want to say it was probably 10 foot tall and, uh, it was probably 24 feet wide. So it was a pretty big area. Um, and I, I forgot to mention, we did a, a separate mural of, uh, basically, uh, QR codes, one for our Google rate review and then one for our Yelp review. And then underneath it says, tell us how we're doing. So big and bright, right by our front desk, there's a mirror wall that 
uh, has a it's a it's a picture of a girl with folded laundry kind of handing it over a counter and so people can just use their phone and give us a quick google rating there or yelp rating so uh, again another way to try and get more more ratings and also it's kind of putting us out there because if we do something wrong then it's going to be easy for people to tell us so we we have to be on our toes but that's okay i'm okay with that yeah oh that's awesome that's awesome and i can send you a picture of that too yeah, that'd be great. Uh, and for you and anyone else out there, you know, I'm I'm open to modeling with or without a speedo <laughs> for a mural wall. I mean, just let me know. I'm trying uh, to keep customers, Jordan. Really? <laughs> <laughs> for your competitors, I mean, that's what I mean. Ah, yeah, okay, there you go. If you want to, <laughs> if you want to, you know, prank them, we'll have that mural wall installed with me and speedo saying, "How are we doing?" Yeah. There you uh, go. No, that's awesome, dude. And I love the I love the mural wall idea. I, it's so easy, you know, especially like the sort of that sleek modern look, which I like. Uh, but sometimes it can get kind of bland, and you know, so I love the idea of like a mural wall or something like that to, to be able to do it for two, three thousand dollars, four thousand, whatever, uh, in that ballpark. Like that's actually not yeah. that much uh, to do something like that, which is pretty cool. Um, okay, the the last question I had about that first one. Going back to the parking lot one more time, uh, yeah. you know, you mentioned you added, uh, and you know, you're you're leasing the space, right? So you added a parking yes. lot essentially for the landlord, uh, but it was worth yeah. it to you to do that, right? Uh, yeah. Do you have any like? Well, first of all, what what's the square footage of that store? Uh, Forty six hundred square feet. Okay, and do you have any like? Framework that you're trying to think about, maybe even going forward or on this third store or anything like parking spots to square footage or number of machines uh, or anything like that. Are you thinking about it in those terms at all? Or you're just like, Hey, we need more spots. That's all I, I, I don't know that I necessarily have a, have a ratio. Um, I mean, I, I do know I could, I could quickly decide if something worked or not. So I know that we have, you know, going back to the demographics we talked about, uh, we've got about, we have 55 total machines in that store, um, which is about, 55 too few, yes, <laughs> me. But anyway, it is what it is. Um, and so we have 28 parking spaces, uh, 4,600 square feet. In our second store uh, up in uh, the northern part of Nashville, uh, we have 6,700 square feet there. So it's a, it, it really is a huge store. Uh, and we have 60 machines in there. So not actually a whole lot more. Um, the, the difference is... Uh, it's part of a strip center. So the first store is standalone um, with 28 parking spots. The second store is an end cap on a, a strip center. And so we have, I want to say about, uh, I would say probably about 14 upfront parking spots and then very easily about 20 or 25 spots kind of out in the general parking lot. Um, which for that store works really well. Um, of course, there's handicap right up close uh, that, that takes up a couple of spots. But, um, you know, if, if you're going to build a, a four or 5,000 square feet um, store, if you've got a population of, of more than between 40 and 100,000, you're going to want 60, 70, 80 machines in there. And you're going to want to have close to 30 parking spots. At least that's that's what I would suggest. Um, you don't want to, um, you know, cut yourself off at any point um, by by going short. I, I've looked at a lot of locations, potential locations for stores, both when I was looking for number two and number three. And as soon as I pulled up, decided it wasn't a good fit. Even though the demographics looked great, there was just no way for any of those people to park there. So, yeah. Yeah. And parking is a big deal. And it's one of the, I think it's overlooked uh, a lot of times is you know, yes. that, that parking situation, but it really can be sort of a choke point for your business. Your store could have a lot more capacity left and the demand can even be there. But like you said, if they can't get their laundry there. Right. Now, if you're in a, if you're in a more uh, urban setup and there's, there's public transit, that kind of thing, then that's, that's a different world. We don't have a lot of public transit or I should say effective public transit in the Nashville area. So it's not really a, a thing that we look for, at least right now. Uh, but uh, it, it definitely can be a choke point. And, and honestly, something that I've seen in a lot of the new laundromats that are opening up, and, you know, I, I don't mean to offend anyone if that's the case, but I see a lot of them opening up without upfront parking. 
So in other words, it's, you know, you have to walk across the drive, you know, if it's on a strip mall or something like that, your customers have to walk across the road to get to your store. And, and to me, that's just, that, that's a no go for any location, just because a lot of people, you know, like to back up, open their trunk or open their, uh, the back of their SUV and unload and having to do that to go all the way across and wait for cars, especially if it's a really busy strip center, it just creates another hindrance and another reason for them to go somewhere else. So I always look for upfront parking and lots of it. So, yeah, yeah, and I agree too. Uh, you know, having the having the you know twenty five spots at for the strip center, you know, or whatever it is, like I think that's great to have that because you you're probably going to need more than your you know fourteen right. upfront spots. Uh, yeah, but you know, I mean, you, you lose effectiveness of the parking spots as a draw the further out you go, the more they have to haul their laundry. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, obviously you've got to have the rollover, but um, I think essentially if you can say you've got up front, it sure makes it a lot easier, especially on days when it's slow or, you know, it's raining. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't know what that raining thing is here in California. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're California. It doesn't I, do that I've there, does it? I've seen it in the movies, I think. I'm not sure. If yeah, it's we're raining. like, <laughs> we're mini Seattle here. I don't know. It rains every day here. Yeah, but it's <laughs> beautiful there. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, all right. So store number two, let's roll into that sucker. <laughs> Cause I think you, you were starting to say that you were, yeah. you were getting ready to put this puppy up last time we talked. Yeah. Let's jump in. Yeah. That. And it's been a, it's been a completely different experience. Uh, so, so, well, so when we opened store one, uh, immediately day one, people started rolling in and we were, I think I even talked about it on the last podcast we were, we were cash flow positive after month one there. Um, not the same experience here. And, and, and I don't think most people have that experience. And I, I think I mentioned that, but um, I, I didn't expect it to be that way. So <laughs> I, my expectations were not near as, as high as they were after going through store number one. Um, so it, it was a bit of a struggle at that store to really get to a point to where we were seeing regular traffic. And, and there's a few reasons for that. And a couple that honestly were were mistakes that I made. Um, number one, my and this is something I still have to work on because the sign is still there because it costs a lot of money. I have not replaced my sign. But um, as I was and when I do, I'll have a professional you know create it for me to ensure that it's very readable from a distance. Because as you look at my sign from, say, the intersection that's near our store, um, you really can't read it. And that, that doesn't help you at all. And then right beside me, there's, a, you know, like a, a, an insurance agency or something and their sign. I can read their sign from the, from the intersection. So I know if I'm looking for it, I can see it. Um, but I think I, one thing I definitely need to do there as far as reinvesting in the business is look at doing a new exterior sign and have the design redone so that it's very readable from a distance away. Um, it looks great. It lights up at nighttime. <clears throat> you can actually read it better at nighttime. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it just it just really didn't didn't stand out. And then also. Um, Google had our address wrong at the very beginning. And it was something I didn't catch. So if you were Googling us, it would have you going down to the far opposite end of the strip center, which is a pretty, pretty long strip center. So uh, that was something I had to work really hard to get, get the pin set exactly on our address. And so I was constantly having people call me and says, I, I see you on Google, but I can't find you. Where are you? Um, and then I would have customers come in and say, you know, after I've been open for six months, I, I drive right past here. I didn't know you were here. Oh my gosh, it's the worst thing I want to hear. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So from a marketing perspective, you know, lesson learned, it's got to be a really strong, really good signage up front. And, and your Google marketing has to be on point with address, with, you know, everything that you possibly can do to make sure people know about you. And, you know, I think one thing I've learned since then, too, is to because I did have to, honestly, I just had to work harder at this store to get it up and running like it is now than I did at the first one. So it was almost like learning for the first time. Um, but I, um, I got involved in Facebook groups. Uh, there's 
local Facebook groups for the community um, that I'll go and post different things on about our specials that we're doing or, um, you know, uh, about amenities within our store uh, to make, make sure people know about it. We've done a few free laundry days there. And so I always put those in there to make sure people know about it. But again, it's, it's not as highly populated of an area as the first store, uh, but, and, and it's also more in the middle of a commercial area, which is a little different as well. So it, it's a different marketing approach when you're in that scenario. Um, so going back to my own advice that we talked about at the beginning of the podcast, know where your people are going to go on a day-to-day basis and how you can approach them uh, and, and how you can make sure you get on their radar. So Anyway, um, lots of lessons learned through this one. And I think now as we go right into number three, I think number three is going to be closer to my second store as far as experience wise. So that's what I'm preparing for. Uh, so when we open the doors there, um, it, it's going to be, you know, uh, a completely different animal, if you will. Yeah. Um, all right. A couple of questions on store number two. I mean, you mentioned, you know, store number one, profitable month one, uh, yeah. and not the same for month two or for store two, which yeah. is a bummer. Uh, yeah. if you've, if you've reached that point now, do you know how long it took to get to the profitability? So yes, it, it took us about, about six months from a, a walk-in, a self-serve perspective. Um, what I did do in the very beginning, and I really didn't count this in the equation just because I felt like it was cheating, <laughs> but we have a, a really large commercial customer that we work for, uh, that I moved to this facility from the old facility. And so the reason I did that is because obviously the larger, larger space, and we also have ozone in the new facility as well. So I wanted to kind of have that as a, as a selling point to keep this customer uh, a little, make them a little more sticky. Um, so we moved the new customer there. So that was already some built in revenue. And I mean, some folks might say, well, you didn't have to cheat. That's not cheating. You know, if, if you're still profitable with the other store, you can now say you're profitable there. But in my mind, I, I want to see the walk in business get up to a certain point and then tie in the drop in and then we can add the commercial part. So it took us about six months from a walk in and a, customer, uh, non-commercial drop-off perspective. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, so a couple, a couple of my thoughts on that are number one, it's just one of the perks of having multiple locations, right? Is that <laughs> yeah. you have this ability to kind of move customers around and, you know, in employees too, sometimes if you need to do that, if you're, if you're in the same general area, like you have some of that benefits of scale when you've got multiple locations to be able to do some of that stuff. So kudos to you and, you know, uh, help, help cover those costs, uh, early on, right. When you're, when you're building it. Yes. So, I mean, I think that's great. Uh, but I also like that you didn't necessarily count that in terms of profitability. You want it to stand on its own two feet kind of thing. Um, which is great. And, you know, to, to have that mentality. And I think it's more for the mentality than the books. Like if you were able to get, profitability by moving this one customer from one location to the other, then awesome. Like that's great. Right. And, you know, the books can show it profitable, but having that mentality of like, Hey, I don't want to just rely on this one customer to keep me profitable. I want to go out there and yeah. make it profitable on its own two feet. Um, I think it's awesome. And I think, you know, it, this is one you, did you build it from scratch or did you buy it and retool it? No, we, it was a, a restaurant previously. So uh, we've, we've built both of ours. The first one was a daycare previously, and this one was a, uh, a restaurant. So, yeah. And, uh, and, you know, what I see a lot of times just from talking to a lot of people is really it takes six to 18 months to reach profitability for a lot of these new builds, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and even for some of these like zombie map builds uh, where they're in more competitive markets, a lot of times it's that six to 18 months that it takes. And that's something that a lot of people don't think about uh, you know, hopefully if you're building out a store and you're investing a lot of money, you're thinking about that sort of that lead right. time to profitability. Um, yes. it gets missed. A absolutely. Uh, you, you absolutely have to have capital on hand and, and have that in your budget to allow for it. So, yeah. Um, and you mentioned a couple of things that you did, uh, cause I was, I mean, I'm, I'm always curious, like when people are building out new stores, 
you know, obviously everybody who's coming to do laundry in your new store after you build it out is currently doing laundry somewhere else. So you have got That's to typically you know, break yeah. some habits. You've got to incentivize people uh, to come to your store and then you've got to incentivize them to develop new habits of coming to your store uh, <laughs> right. to do laundry, which is easier said than done, right? Like humans are habitual creatures and uh, breaking habits and, and establishing new habits is that can be uh, tricky. So, I mean, you mentioned uh, doing like jumping in the Facebook groups and doing free laundry days. I mean, is that the primarily how you gained new customers? Yes. And again, going back to what we talked about earlier, um, my, ma- my manager there, uh, her name is Vilma. She came from store number one. And uh, Vilma is an expert at, customer service. I mean, like she is, I mean, she's better than I ever dared to be. She just knows how to uh, build a relationship with people. And it's just, it's an amazing thing to watch. And, and that was a lot of the reason why I I thought she would do really well at starting the stores because she can build those relationships. And so, um, you know, again, if you go and you read our reviews for this specific location, I'm going to guarantee you. So, so just to give you an idea, I told, I mentioned the other store, we were at 4.7 Google rating, uh, which is awesome, right? It's, it's about as good as it can get, uh, considering every once in a while, you're going to have some, some people that aren't happy with you. Um, at this store, we have a 4.8 so far. And we had, I, I was looking the other day, we had 154 total Google reviews and that's in two years. Uh, so I'm pretty happy with that. And out of those 154, 141 of those are five star. So, I mean, and, and I guarantee out of 141, I bet you there's a hundred that mentioned Vilma. <laughs> it would not surprise me in the least if her name specifically is mentioned in a hundred of those because people just, they, they love her. And um, it, it just has made all the difference there. So word of mouth has been a big part of, of what we've done there. And it's grown. And uh, I think with that good rating now, people people will use that as their tool for finding their laundromat if they've just moved into the area. And yes, I think you do break a lot of habits of people who were going other places to now come to your store. But, you know, the nature of being a renter is that you are by nature kind of transient. Uh, So a lot of people move into the area, a lot of people move out. So that Google rating is going to be important to lure those new customers when they move in. So I think that's helped us a lot too. Yeah, that's huge. Uh, you know, and it, I mean, I just I keep getting reminded of like all star owners, all, you know, all day, every day are like customer service, customer service, customer <laughs> service. I just keep getting reminded of the the book, uh, Unreasonable Hospitality. Right. And just you treat people well and they're going to treat you well back. Right. Your business. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well and we we I sent my employees as well, so I, I will be fully transparent in this. If they talk to a customer who, you know, says, "Oh, this is great, we we love this place," you know, I, I ask them, "Hey, that's who you need to ask for a rating." You know, ask them at that point, "Hey, do you mind going and give us a, giving us a rating on Google or Yelp?" It it helps us grow our business, and and then I'll even tell them, "Hey, if they mention your name." then, you know, there might be a, a little reward for you in it. So that's one of those things too. You kind of incent your employees to help grow your business all at the same time. Uh, you know, I, I don't think you can necessarily incent the customer anyway. You know, Hey, if you give us a five star, we'll give you 10 bucks or off the wash or something. No, I don't like to do that. I'd, I'd rather be a legitimate real review. So I like to incent the employees to ask for it. Yeah, and if, that, you know, if they don't want to give the rating, they won't, you know, so <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think that's great. Uh, I think that's great advice. And I, you know, I think, uh, you know, incentivizing the employees uh, to ask for that rating also yeah. kind of indirectly incentivizes them to be a good employee. <laughs> right. right. I mean, their incentiv- name's going to be on it again. <laughs> yeah. And maybe you should just make sure you clarify that if it's mentioned in the review and it's positive that they get the incentive. <laughs> yeah, right. If it's negative, yeah, we, we take money no. <laughs> Get all these negative reviews, but get my name mentioned. It's great. Uh, my name's funny. Jordan, if you're going to leave a review. <laughs> uh, knocking the laundry out of their hands. There uh, you go, yeah. Hey. Uh, out of curiosity, I mean, you mentioned your, your, 
manager who kills it with customer service. I mean, is she just like mega friendly? Is she doing anything in particular that's great? She's just yeah. customer service. She's, just, she's mega friendly. She's just yeah. the nicest lady. I, I like I said, I have a, a few core employees that have been with me almost since the beginning. And, uh, so, uh, Vilma, who is the manager at my, uh, my Madison store and then Darling, who is the manager at my uh, original store in Antioch. I mean, and they've, they've been with me, uh, over four years now. So when I first started the business, I was the only employee for the first 90 days. I think Vilma was employee number three and Darling was employee like number five. And so since then they've, I mean, they're part of my family. I, you know, I, when their kids come in, you know, I get the chance to hang out with them, you know, just as much as I, I hang out with their mother uh, over the course of a week. So, you know, I enjoy that. And, and that's to me is a big part of of why I'm doing this. You know, I, I couldn't do that in the corporate world. I just, you know, you can make friends and make buddies, but it's it's just different. Yeah, I mean, it's it's huge to, I you know you read all the business books and you do all this stuff. I mean, getting the right people in the right seats yep. on the team is just, it's critical, right? To run into good business. Well, and they, they're each, they're very similar, right? As far as they, is that, um, you know, uh, mindset about, about the business, but they actually have different skill sets that they're, that they really excel at and it really helps them be successful at what they do. So uh, I couldn't, I couldn't have prayed for a better combination of, of, of folks to run my, my two stores. And, and I'm really excited about the person that I'm going to, going to use to run my third store as well. So, um, infrastructure is what it's all about. Um, they make my life so much easier on a day-to-day basis. I, so I told my wife, I, I was telling her, you know, what I was going to give, give them as their Christmas bonus. And she kind of, kind of gasped a little bit. And I was like, Hey, don't you think it's worth it? The time I get to spend with you and the kids rather than being at the laundromat because they're there doing their job. And she's like, yep, I agree. Go ahead. <laughs> that was risky. Cause I'm not sure my wife would have been like, maybe give me a little less and be gone. A little longer. I don't know. <laughs> risky, risky business. Uh, yeah. No, I love that. And I, I mean, I think that mentality is, you know, I, it's, Critical. And especially if your goal is to build a business, right? If your goal is to kind of have a job to replace your job or what, like you want to work in your laundromat, right. whatever, that's one thing. And that's a different sort of mindset. And that's, and there's nothing wrong with that either. Uh, but if your goal is to sort of build a business and not be the one doing the business, like working in the business, your, your right. job is to go out and find location number three, coordinate the building, put the right people in place, making sure the marketing's all good to go making sure everything's running smooth, like that over, you know, the whole working on the business type of deal, you've got yeah. to have the right people. And then you've got to take care of them to keep them around. Uh, Cause you're not just competing with, you know, other laundromats or you're competing with all other jobs that they can have. You're exactly if they don't right. like working for you and with you. Guess what? They're going to go out and find, if they're a quality person, they're going to find another place to work. And so I, I love this business. It's been one of the best things about it is just, you know, being able to have the freedom that it provides and to, to be able to spend t- more time with my family, um, you know, go to all of my kids' sporting events. Uh, I'm always there. Now, there are some late nights where I have to leave and odd times where I have to go because of an emergency or what have you. Those things happen. Uh, they absolutely do, but I'm totally okay with that. Uh, but what is even kind of uh, an equally exciting thing about it is I've watched a lot of these folks that work for me kind of grow in their life along with us. So they've, I've seen them go from being renters to being homeowners, to, to buying new vehicles, to having children and their kids uh, going to better schools, um, you know, things like that. I mean, Vilma, for example, she was excited about coming to this store and being the manager because there was a really good school that she wanted her kids to go to. And so they've been going there for the last two years and she is just ecstatic about it. And so it's things like that, that you not only impact your customers' lives by giving them an, an unbelievable place to, to do a, a mundane weekly thing, 
but you give a vehicle for your employees to just expand their lives and to uh, just to live a better life as a whole. And, and to me, that I gain more out of that than I do everything else. I just I love bragging about that. And I'm not a, a you know a braggart of sorts, but I will definitely brag about that every opportunity I get. And your hair. Uh, those two things <laughs> will give you permission to brag. See, what you can't see is this head, headphones are kind of blocking the bad part. <laughs> you know what? I can't see it. Can't tell. It don't matter. Yeah, man. You're looking good. That's all I can tell. That's good. <laughs> you know, and when you, you know, when you do finally lose it all, you can still keep it long in the back and, and have the oh, skull yeah. going. I live on, in Tennessee, you know? man. I could do that all day That's long. That's what I'm talking about. The skull <laughs> is where it's at. Uh, I've got. One more question, I think, unless another one's pop up, which could happen. Sure. One more question before we jump into the next segment of the podcast. Uh, you know, you've got two stores working on number three. All three of them, you're, you're building. And one of the big questions I get a lot is the buy versus build question. So I'm curious, like, why have you decided to build and not buy existing? Um, and what do you recommend uh, people do? And maybe those are yeah. two different questions well so to be honest i've tried both i have i've tried to buy existing laundromats and in this market there is no one willing to sell <laughs> uh, i think I've, I've talked to almost everyone um and just uh, i guess everyone loves the business as much as i do i don't know uh but it, it's really hard to find available opportunities um that's that's one reason number two a lot of the existing laundromats, well, let me back up a second. So one of the th reasons why I got into this business was because I saw an opportunity to take these awful, dingy, nasty laundromats and create this these wonderful, beautiful places for people to go. And uh, so part of that is that a lot of them are small. The infrastructure isn't really there to, to, to meet the vision that I have for what I want to offer my customers. And, and kind of have our brand stamped on. So that's a lot of the reason why I've, I've chosen to build uh, in most of these cases uh, rather than, than purchase existing. Um, the, the third one that we're about to do, I think I said it was going to be a little bit different than the other two scenarios. So it's in a smaller town, uh, not in a major uh, metropolitan area. Um, and we actually are purchasing the building, what we've already purchased the building in this case. So uh, it's a little different from an investment perspective. So my wife and I will um, will own the building. And of course, the business will then lease it from us. So it kind of creates some, uh, some generational wealth for my family personally on top of the business, uh, a little bit of a retirement, uh, you know, alternative retirement plan as well. Um, so we'll own the we'll own the uh, the building, and it's actually a pretty large building. Um, it's about I think it was sixty three hundred square feet total. So we're going to do about a four thousand square foot laundromat, and then we're going to have a separate uh, shell space that we'll rent out to another customer or to a, another business. Uh, so it kind of gives us the opportunity to generate a little additional revenue. Um, this it was a a restaurant as well. So the good thing about building a laundromat in a previous restaurant is that a lot of the the water, the gas, the electrical are already there because uh, restaurants tend to, to utilize a lot of the same utilities. The, the water, we might have to upgrade that a little bit, but for the most part, everything else is there. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of one of those things that I think uh, uh, goes back to what we talked about earlier is what you want to look for in a potential location. But I love building out because I can put my stamp on it. I can put machines where I want them. I can even, and then we did this in store number two, we'll do it in store number three too. I can allow for future growth. So uh, within my bulkheads at my store number two, I have the uh, ability to add more machines if I need to. Within the wall, I have the ability to add additional dryers if I need to. Um, so it, it just it just gives me more flexibility. And, and I learned that from the first store. There's no flexibility there. I can't add there. Uh, but so I'm not going to make that mistake again because I expect to do well and I expect to grow and, and provide something that people are going to want to come to. Uh, that's not boastful. It's just that's that's kind of my mindset and anything that I do. I want to I want to be great at it. So. Dude, I love that. 
uh, I love the that mindset. Like I expect to do well, so I'm going to plan for that, and uh, and then just make it happen. That's, that's right. Great. Make it happen. All right, we have. Dude, thank you for sharing all of that stuff. That's you know, dude, su- such good stuff. And I'm glad uh, your first one is just still killing it. I'm glad your second one, you got it up and running. You got it figured out. And uh, exciting about that third one where you're basically just utilizing it to manipulate getting on the podcast a third time. But that's fine. <laughs> you know, that's fine. Uh, you know, it's, it's the hair. I'm going to let you back on either way because of the hair. So. Hey, I'll, I'll come up with something different for the next podcast. That's what I'm talking something about. A little, something a little more exciting, maybe a purple <laughs> mohawk or something. <laughs> well, let me know beforehand. Maybe we can coordinate even. That'd be great. Oh, okay. Uh, Deal. I am a little nervous, though, that, you know, Whenever I take any hair off, I'm, I don't know if it's coming back or not. <laughs> yeah, but you got this. Look at that beard you got, man. I can't grow any of that stuff. That's nice. Oh, man, it's just like a couple of days. It just pops up like that. Yeah. No, this is like four months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Grows that's on my head, not on my face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I find when you get older. It stops growing where you want it to and starts growing in other places you don't want it to. So. Yeah, right. Oof. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> Uh, all right. So we have another segment of the podcast called secret sauce. And that is, Hey, what tip do you have for somebody who's currently owning, operating laundromats and, uh, maybe can help them level up to the next level? Um, well, so I had two and we already talked about one, which was kind of the, the asking for reviews part. Um, you know, we talked about the importance of that, so I I won't get into that anymore, but I think another thing that's really important is go and use your services. You know, if, if, if you've got a self-serve laundromat, go and use your machines, use different ones. If you've got a machine that, you know, some folks are having some trouble with, go and use it yourself, see what's happening with it. You know, if your clothes come out nice and clean, like you like them, use the dryers, use different dryers every time. Um, you know, see what you're offering to the people yourself, send your wife or your husband, if it's the other way around, you know, have them try it and give their feedback, send your aunt, your uncle, whoever it is, someone, you know, someone you feel comfortable in their, their opinion, you know, they'll be honest with you, ask them to go and and check out your, your place and give feedback to you. Uh, I think that could be pretty powerful and letting you know, Hey, if there's something you need to tweak or something you're doing right. Hey, I'm doing it right. Let's keep doing this. Um, I think that could be really powerful. Uh, drop off. If you, uh, if you have drop off service, go and drop your clothes off, let your attendants do it. Um, there's been many times where I've identified opportunities for us to fold things a little differently, to package them a little differently, because when I get at home, I realize, Oh, you know what? This doesn't really make sense. We should be doing it like this. Or my wife says, Hey, why don't they try this? I like this better. <laughs> You know, so it's a good way to trial and error to use your own stuff and and figure out how it goes. If you're doing pickup and deliver it, same thing. See how your drivers, are they on time? You know, are they, are they doing, doing the job they're supposed to be doing, taking care of your stuff? And, um, I just think it's really important to, to not just feel like you're doing a great job, but actually from experience, know you are. Yeah. I love that. Uh, I love that sort of that quality control, uh, you got going on there just to make sure everything's. Right, yeah. Smooth and every week. <laughs> yeah. Oh, do you do it every week? Yeah. I mean, that was part uh, part of my promise to my wife to start the the laundromat business is that she wouldn't have to do laundry anymore. So, I'm trying to keep that going. I love that. Love it. Love it. Love it. Uh, I mean, I think it's the perk of owning the laundromat, right? It's like the number one reason why yeah. you should probably just have a drop off service, if not a pickup and delivery. It's so well, so and I pay easy. too. We pay for it. I tip just like a regular customer, all that. So, yep. Killer. Awesome. Uh, all right. We have another segment called Pro Tips. And Pro Tips is what's your best advice for somebody trying to get into the business, especially right now? I mean, I think what you're seeing in terms of like the inventory thing, that I, I'm seeing that all over the place, yeah. uh, all over the country right now. Uh, it's just, it's tough to find those laundromats uh, right now. But if, you have any advice for somebody trying to get in? What would that be? Um, well, I think you need to really understand the amount of capital that's involved in in starting this business. And depending on the scenario you choose, whether it be uh, buying an existing laundromat or building from scratch, uh, those two numbers are different. 
Um, building from scratch will require much more capital than actually purchasing, uh, because in most cases you do have to add in all the infrastructure. If you're buying an existing laundry, um, hopefully they're going to already have those things in place. Now you might have to retool and put new equipment in. Um, there's a cost involved with that, of course. Uh, but it's not as great as having to not only buy new equipment, but also install plumbing, install electrical, install gas, install ductwork, build the walls, um, you know, all the things that are involved with a, a, a complete build out. Um, so there's capital differences there. And when you're budgeting that capital, make sure you do like we talked about allowing for the, uh, the runway. You've got to have a runway after you're open so that you can stay open but knowing that you're not going to be profitable. Uh, my experience with my first laundry was not typical. Um, I hope and pray that everyone has that same experience that I did because that would be wonderful for you. Uh, but it's not the case, unfortunately. Um, so, um, you know, make sure you've got the capital there to allow for that. And you don't get into a scenario where you're coming towards the end of your rope and you're all of a sudden having to take out credit cards with these balances just to keep you moving because that's going to put you in a kind of a, a hole to start off with. Um, now, um, you know, credit these days is super expensive. You know, uh, I know a lot of people have funded laundries in the past through HELOC loans and things like that, and that money is really expensive. Uh, so do not forget about uh, what, what interest rates are like these days and, and make sure you understand that as part of your holding costs, there's going to be some expense there, not only while you're building, but while you're growing to be, to be profitable. Um, and, and that can add up in a hurry. Um, I, I would also make sure not only understand the capital aspect of it and, and talk to your distributor. If you have a good distributor, talk to them and they will kind of help you understand the budgeting for the, once you get the store open, uh, but then you you might want to talk to other laundromat owners about what you need to budget while you're building out, and then also um, you know while you're, you're you're going down that runway. Um, but also think about the time that's involved. Um, so for example, when when we built the first store, it was going to take three months. It ended up taking nine months. When we built the second store, it was going to take three months. It ended up taking six months. So no matter what, it's going to take longer than you think, going to cost more than you think. So you need to be prepared for that. And, um, and, and not only time that it takes to do the build out, but your personal time. Um, and this, I know this has been mentioned on here many times, and, and I'm afraid that, you know, there, I see lots of laundromats opening up all over the country. I've seen lots of them opening up in our market, brand new laundromats, more probably in the last five years than the previous 10 or 20. Um, and, and a lot of that has to do with kind of the, uh, you know, the growth of the, of the business. And I think there's a lot of really good owners coming into this business, really intelligent, uh, really know how to run a business, really uh, geared up and ready to, to hit the road uh, hard. But you have to know that this business is not just a go collect coins and it's passive. <laughs> it's funny, almost every single week uh, at some odd time of the day, uh, there's Facebook groups out there of, of existing owners and some Facebook owner will post a picture of something crazy happening in their laundry and they'll put hashtag passive income because it's a joke because it's not. It's not passive income. And you have to know that you're going to be spending weird hours uh, in a bad part of town, most likely uh, at your store. Um, and, and knowing that, you know, in the beginning, it's going to take a lot of your time. Your family needs to be aware of the time it's going to take. Prepare them as well, because you you might have to leave that baseball game early or you might have to miss, um, you know, church one Sunday morning because you've, you've got a flood in your floor. And it's happened to me a few times, unfortunately. So me too. <laughs> we can we can sit here and talk about all the wonderful things that happen in this business. But there's a lot of, of, of bad things, too. And in my opinion, the good far outweighs the bad. But you've got to mentally be prepared for the time it's going to take to deal with those things and, and to deal with getting up and, and off the ground. So, Yeah, awesome. Awesome advice uh, for anybody, you know, getting in into the business. That time and money uh, yeah. and knowledge that you've got to have, like you, you want to you want to make sure you have realistic expectations of what you're getting into. And, you know, there's a lot of people who 
our soul, well, myself included, when I first got in this business, I sold that dream of the passive income. And then, you know, after the first year, realized this is not what I expected and, and get out of the business. <laughs> That's uh, right. It's a tale as I, old as time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've, I've had 2 a.m. wake up calls because someone had passed away in one of my bathrooms. So there's stuff like that. Yeah. Stuff, stuff happens. And, you know, not to, not to oversell the horror stories, but uh, it does happen. It's not smooth sailing. Uh, right. All, no, it's not. Time. But I, I still, I have to actually, even with, and we've talked about a lot of the negative stuff today, but even with that, when I talk to people about this business, I have to force myself to talk about the bad usually because I'm so excited about the good because it, it really is uh, amazing. So, Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, you know, it's not, it's not to discourage anybody, but it is to give just a realistic expectation, right? Like yeah. most of it's good, but whenever you're, I say this all the time, right? Whenever you're dealing with people or machines, you're going to have problems. And with laundromats, yeah. you get a whole bunch of both. So right. problems come up. Uh, yeah. Sure. Uh, all right. Our last segment we have is called recommended resources. Do you have any resources that you recommend to help people either grow themselves personally or their businesses? Um, yeah, so I'll remind people of, from the last one in case you didn't do see that or forgot, but we talked about the book Good to Great uh, by uh, Jim Collins. I love that book. Uh, again, I want to reiterate that one. But I think uh, even since then, I've learned more than anything else. The best resource as a laundry owner are other laundry owners. Um, you know, I have, uh, you know, I mentioned uh, all the laundromats that have opened in this market. I'm friends with a couple of the guys that have opened them in this market. And I talk to those guys on a regular basis. I mean, they are, they are really good resources, even though they've been in the business shorter, shorter time frame than I have. Uh, but they, everyone has different experiences. Uh, everyone has different opinions on things. So I really think it's good to kind of, you know, um, fill your mind with, uh, with all there is from different levels of experience, people who've been in for 30, people who've been in it for 30 days, uh, all the way to people who have one laundromat to people who have 40 or 50. Uh, the more people you can talk to and the, the greater network you can build, uh, that's the best resource you can have. If you've got a phone number that you can call or text within a second and get a good answer that you trust, there's no better resource than that. Um, so I, I would say build a, a, a network and a resource of laundry owners and you'll be set for a long time. Now, be prepared to give back to that network because if you're going to take from it, you got to give back too. So I think it goes both ways. Love that. Uh, really, really great advice. Uh, last thing I have for you before I want to tell you one more time how awesome you are is <laughs> if anybody has questions uh, or wants to talk more about uh what you got going on or what they've got going on. What's the best way they can get a hold of you? Yeah, sure. Um, so you can reach me via email. My email is Steve at all things ENT.com. That's short for all things enterprises. So it's A L L T H I N G S E as an elephant N T. Um, you can also, I mean, we're on, uh, on Google, of course um, we're on uh, Instagram and Facebook at Wash House Clean. Um, our, go check out our website. Um, we got to do a few updates to that, but it's uh, www.washhouseclean.com. Uh, yeah, we'll have links to all of that in the show notes uh, for you. If you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe, and then you can check down below in the description uh, for all the links to all that. Steve, you are awesome. Thank you for coming on the show. Racing us that. with your presence uh, and that hair, of course. Uh, but seriously, <laughs> sharing, uh, man, just so much good, solid information about uh, your story, but also what you're doing and how it's panning out so that we can have an idea of how we can improve our businesses, man. I think it's uh, huge, and 100 episodes is way too long between episodes. So, you know, now that I know your plot to weasel your way back on, obviously, uh, we'll do it <laughs> less than a hundred episodes from now for sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Got to. Yeah. And, uh, man, appreciate you taking the time to come on again and share your wisdom and knowledge and, uh, looking forward to the next episode and, uh, hopefully other things between now and then too. Awesome. Thanks, man. 
You're a rock star. All right, I hope you love that interview with Steve Andrews uh, out there in Nashville, Tennessee. Again, huge shout out and thanks to Steve for coming on, sharing his wisdom and his story and the update from last time he was on the podcast. Uh, dude, I love Steve and I, Steve, you're welcome on the podcast anytime you want to come on. Uh, su such good stuff and we have a really good time doing it. But remember, none of this means anything unless you put it into action. So find something, one thing that you can put into action this week, this week, if not today, that you can put into action. Those actions, as we stack them up every week, are what are going to pave the path to success, to achieving your goals, to building the life you want to build. Uh, whatever it is you're after, it's the action that's going to get you there. So for me, um, my big takeaway is sort of an action and sort of a mindset. I love, I wrote this quote down. He said, I expect to do well. And for me, I it just clicked there and I was like, yes, that is awesome. That's a great mindset to have whenever, you know, you, you venture on a new, uh, a new path, a new adventure, um, or as you are trying to go further down the path you're already on. Uh, so that I expect to do well mindset is something that I'm going to be uh, implementing and taking with me uh, from this interview. So huge shout out to Steve for that. What is your one thing that you're going to go put into action? Uh, write it down. Tell a friend. Go to the forums, automatresource.com slash forums uh, and, you know, put it, uh, share it there so that we can keep each other accountable. Uh, and listen, let's get after it. All right. 2024 is about to be here. Let's get after it this year. Let's make this year the year that you change your life. How about that? All right. We'll see you next week. Peace.